Hey everybody, it's Griff here, and I have some big, big news for fans of the Hideous Laughter podcast. Today, we're announcing the release of our Patreon. So you, as the awesome Carrion crowd you are, can now support us to help create even more awesome content. So I wanted to give you guys a little bit of details on, you know, what you could be hoping to enjoy from said Patreon. So we've got a couple of tiers here. The first being the hams tier, which lets you decide what we will be drinking on air through a series of polls, and it's pretty dope. The next tier up, rum and coke. You get everything from the hams tier, but you also get access to private parts of our Discord server to chat with other patrons like yourself. But that's not all. You are going to get our episode drops early. So you'll get them at least a day early, and you'll get to listen before anybody else does. Next tier up is the Whiskey Neat. It's everything in the previous tier, but another cool benefit. At least twice per month, you are going to be able to join a chat with the Hideous Laughter crew while we do a live action drinking game for the latest episode. So you'll be able to play our drinking games alongside with us. Now that also means that you're going to have time to chat with us, ask questions, and just kind of shoot the shit with other members of the carrying crowd. So that should be a blast. Last, but certainly not least, we got the Gasoline Queen special. You'll get everything from the prior tiers, but you also are going to start getting unique merchandise. So shirts, bottle openers, koozies, that kind of stuff. You'll get that four times a year once we meet our merch goal on Patreon. Just wanted to take a quick moment to talk about some of our goals. Now, we love producing this content for you guys. You're the absolute best fans in the world. Our first goal, though, is to fully fund our podcast. We, we'd like to be able to produce this content at no cost to ourselves. That would be really awesome because, let's face it, a podcast takes a lot of a lot of investment to keep going. We have hosting fees and equipment and stuff that we need to keep producing cool content for you guys. But just hosting the podcast, that's not really a fun goal. Next goal we have is to start making merch for you guys. We've heard it loud and clear. You want a Team Slurp Bro Tank. You want a Team No Slurp Bro Tank. You want some merch that you can wear from the HLP. We're looking to do that, and we're really excited for some of the designs we have in the pipe. And finally, you know, we're going to add more to these tiers, but this last one's near and dear to my heart. Our goal is to start putting out Evil Interlude episodes more frequently. We know that you guys have loved Saw and Nana Opal, Mr. Turner and Dr. Viv, and we want to get a chance to bring those characters back in a big way. So. If we reach the funding for that goal, we'll be plowing through Evil Interlude content at least every other month, and it should be fantastic. I'm so excited for that. We have a lot more goals that we've been thinking of, and if with your support, we're so excited to produce even more stuff that you guys are going to enjoy. With all that said, and thanks for listening to my uh, my little soapbox here, please enjoy episode 35 Seymour Wiener. Do you like liquor and things that go boo? Then buckle up, listener, because this one's for you. Prepare yourself for the Hideous Laughter Podcast. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Hideous Laughter Podcast, episode 35. Guys, let's cut the shit this time. I want to know what everybody's drinking. Steve, it looks like that's not a hams. What is that? Just pour the whole thing in. We have time. Yes, Griffin, that is a Clear Sky Daybreak beer from Wolf's Ridge Brewing. Fucking nectar of the gods, man. It's delicious. Speaking of wolves, Brooks, what are you drinking? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's uh let's put a spoilers maybe. 
Oh, spoilers. <laughs> so people are going to listen to 35, then 32. Then they're going to back off, go back to when we got into Harrowstone. Then probably, you know, like the, I don't know, Flaming Town Hall. That's probably another, that's a good midway point. Something like that. Okay, perfect. Well, this is a spring quarter Belgian blonde from Land Grant. Nice. Speaking of land that was granted to people. What? Haley. <laughs> I don't understand your transition. Brooks never gives me a good transition. He only gives me good dick jokes. Interesting. Uh, I have a crook and marker. Whew, that, that was, was a meaty crack. crack. I know, I loved it. Oh, that can. That's a high quality can. That's what you get for paying 17 bucks for eight cans of fucking seltzer. They're gluten free, though. They are. What flavor is that? Mango. Mango. Speaking of mangoes, Emily, how's that mango? <laughs> Whoa. Uh, I'm not drinking a mango flavored drink. I have Riesling tonight. Riesling. We're going wine. Mm-hmm. Speaking of people that wine, I'm drinking a Smirnoff Seltzy Got of em. the watermelon variety. You guys, you save Poppy. You guys, everyone but Eclipse is probably a good person after that. And Matumbe was kind of like a dick the whole time. Nah, he's on the fence. <laughs> he was on the <laughs> fence about saving people. But, uh, but Ickmer and Lear are really, their true color, color shining through. So you save Poppy... You guys got back to the Crooked Ken. You woke up the next morning. Poppy seemed, you know, she's not 100%, but she seemed better. She definitely got some healing from both Sajira and Matumbe in the morning. Oh, that'd be a good radio show. 99.7, Matumbe in the morning. Let's make it happen. And Sajira. <laughs> Matumbe and Sajira in the morning. Patreon goals. Let's go. <laughs> so you woke up in the morning and you guys prepared to continue on your journey. And I think the consensus was that you would stay with the Crooked Kin as their destination is Lepidstat, much like yours. Am I wrong in that uh, assessment of last episode? You guys sticking with these carnies? Yeah, I think so. Sticking with the pack. I knew my, I knew my wolf transition was apt. <laughs> you head out you head out in the morning and you spend a day traveling with these carnies are any of you speaking to any of them trying to get to know any of them now there are a couple carnies that maybe you didn't talk to last night you do see the trio of clowns that you know you only you only kind of saw in passing they kind of helped poppy out but didn't really talk to you guys you saw, actually, when you approached, he's kind of hard to miss, uh, this giant of a man. Like, taller than Matumbe, wider than Matumbe and Ikmer. He wasn't present in the in the kind of panic that was going on the previous night. You haven't really met Poppy's sisters or even asked the bearded lady her name. So, so you have some, I think you have a connection to maybe Sajira and Matumbe has a connection to Prince Czar, and you've all met Captain Caleb, but but aside from that, you haven't really diversified your interests without or throughout the Carnies. So are any of you kind of reaching out to any of these other people to kind of get to know them, since you're going to be traveling with them for, honestly, at this point, probably close to a week, maybe five days. Lyra would be interested in meeting with the triplets now that they're all back together again. You guys are on your way. The triplets are actually riding on one of the wagons. And in this wagon is also the bearded lady. And she's, you know, brushing the hair of the triplets. They're, they're kind of sitting there happy to have Poppy back. Poppy's maybe not 100%. She's kind of taking a nap at this point. But... The other two seem in high spirits. They're glad to have their sister back. And uh, the bearded lady is just fawning over these girls. So Lyra would just walk up and formally introduce herself. Hi, my name's Lyra. We didn't really get a chance to get acquainted yesterday. Everything was so crazy. Oh, 
My name's uh, Lydia Gerard. Pleasure to meet you. I... The girls, they... They don't talk much. They... they maybe you dealt with Poppy. You know, they... They have a special condition. We... We love them like our own, but they're... They're not... They're not going to hold a conversation with you. But it, it, we're so happy to... To have you here. I can't thank you enough for saving their sister. Of course. We're very happy to help anyone that, that needs it. Just just making sure they're all happy here, right? Oh, Even Poppy? I believe so. I, I take good care of the girls. Uh, they're, I could never never have a, have a daughter of, of my own. And uh, it's nice to have them around. I, we're... Not exactly the kind of people that get to stay with their families, get to enjoy a happy life in in one place. I think I think fate brought us all together here, but I'm just happy to have them here because you know they give, they give me a little bit more purpose. You know what I mean? Definitely, family doesn't have to be blood. You can have. Even stronger ties with with those around you that really matter most. I'm glad that they have you to take care of them. Everyone needs someone to make sure they're safe. So in talking with Lydia, you start to get kind of a a better, you know, things were frantic when you first met. You didn't really get a good eye on her. She is nearly seven feet tall. This woman is immensely tall, has... That would make her beard maybe four feet long. Uh, she's she's an anomaly. I think you get the vibes that she's very much a nurturing, like, mother hen type person for this group of people. You watched her interact with the, with the sisters and, and with the little wolf boy. She's definitely one to take care of her own. I think you would surmise, like, even without making a sense motive check, you would know that it seems like these, she's that kind of person. And I think she would invite you to, to sit down for, for an hour or two while the caravans are rolling. It doesn't seem like there's much to do or much trouble in this part of the trail, although it doesn't seem like there's many people either. It seems pretty, pretty vacant. And so she would invite you to sit for a while, and I think you guys would chat. Um, the girls would inevitably do something that, probably made you laugh you know they they're they may not be the brightest bulbs but they're charismatic for what it's worth they're you know they're performers so i think they would try and make you laugh for a little while they would they would kind of like put on a little bit of a show because they're not used to people that they meet staying with them they're used to you know just passers-by that are there for an hour just to watch them do something i don't think they've ever had somebody kind of sit with them just in their natural, you know, state and with their family. So I think they're excited to have you there and you can tell. That would really put Lyra's mind to ease just with everything going on. Like did Poppy run away? Is she really being cared for, but really getting a sense that they're well looked after and this is probably the best place that they can be. And they have an actual family really puts her at ease and makes her happy. That, that they found each other. So you guys spend this time, are any of the other characters, like what are you guys up to as the as the caravan is kind of rolling forward? I mean, Eclipse, unless there's anyone else that is very interested, that sticks out to her in the next, I don't know, a few minutes as you describe people to other cast members, she will probably spend a lot of time with the werewolf boy or the actual like people on the uh, in the adventuring party and Kendra. Okay, so so you're hanging out with Kendra, uh, and the wolf boy is with you. He seems to have taken a shine to you after you give him a ride on the uh, on the mine steed. I think he's he kind of like curls up near you, and like you said, Eclipse is just so good with kids. Yeah, <laughs> it's great. So he would he would be hanging around you. I believe like. Kendra is in your caravan still. Like, that's where she's hanging out. So you're hanging out with her in there, and I imagine you two let the wolf boy hang out with you. Yeah. Um, is there anything you're saying to Kendra 
about maybe her experience with them while you guys were gone or or just her thoughts on the whole situation. We're also traveling by the seaside, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's in Sirenscape, that's the eagle cry. If this is seaside, that changes everything. <laughs> Lyra leaves the party. Yep. Says, fuck Carrion Crown. I'm going for a swim. Legally, you have to tell me if we're by the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> Within the, 50 miles, I would know. The pull is too, too strong. I mean, I don't I don't know if they talk about anything significant realistically. Like, Eclipse is going to probably make kind of small talk. Uh, to maybe ask her more about her childhood. But probably not much about, like what happened with her with the carnies as long as she is safe like that's it i don't i don't really care what she did yeah i think i think kendra would just you know tell you a couple stories about her and her dad maybe because you're heading to lepidstadt she'd tell you about the time when her and professor lorimore lived there Mm -hmm. uh but but to her it was relatively uneventful i mean her dad was a professor at the at the University of Lepidstadt, you know, he was a well-respected man in town. They decided to leave mainly because he was retiring. I mean, he was up in years and you knew that. Mm-hmm. So she just tell you a bit, little bit about that. I think she'd be excited to be going back to Lepidstadt and maybe show you guys some of the places that she knew um, and, and around the university as well. Yeah. And so then otherwise, if she's not with, uh, you know, Kendra and the uh, wolf boy, she would probably be almost following the party around. Uh, Not in like a a weird way, just in like, I want to make sure my friends are going to stay with me and not stay with the carnies full time. Uh, So just like making sure they're still pretty tight knit to her, like still want to make sure that Lyra is her friend, still wants to make sure Matumbe although we have differences on religion, are, are, is still going to stay with me and not stay with the carnies and, and still going to make sure Ikmer, who is our trusty guard, will stay, you know, our, our forever guard. Sounds good. So I imagine you, you kind of touch base with each of them yeah. during the day. Ikmer, are you, are you guarding the caravan? Is that something that Ikmer would do? I, kn- I know he kind of, he got a late start this morning because he was up so late with Poppy. Which makes sense, so that you could get your full night's rest. Got up, you helped everybody set up to leave, and you probably hopped into one of the wagons and fell asleep for a couple hours just so you could not be fatigued. So what is he doing upon kind of waking up in late morning, early afternoon? Yeah, he probably, first of all, like sleeps in an absolute mess. Like, (laughs) the totally spread out. (laughs) <laughs> in the most crazy way and like his hair is all over the place and like a well teenager would do so that's what he would probably wake up like and super groggy and be cranky if he has to wake up before noon just like every other teenager but sure. um as far as being the caravan guard he would very much so do his best and be vigilant throughout the trip is anybody outside when ikmer emerges from from the wagon that he's on i imagine lyra isn't she's spending her time uh with the sisters and with lydia but eclipse you're kind of flying all around the caravan it sounds like matumbe we're not really sure what you're doing yet but would you have been outside do you think I think there's a good chance um, Matumbe would be. I mean, I, I, I mean, he found not only someone from the Mwangi Expanse, but someone from the Mwangi Expanse who reads all of the time. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> so, in my mind, Matumbe would just be, you know, softly grilling this guy. Okay, so the entire journey. So you're probably. I mean, you're probably at this because he's in a he's in a wagon, obviously. Yes. Uh, so you're probably hanging out with him in a wagon when we get to you. So I need Eclipse to make a perception check then, because she would be the only one that, in my mind, would have been outside when Ikmer Ikmer emerges. Ooh, not very high. So that's a total of ten. Uh, You don't notice anything about Ikmer as he he exits. 
But Igmar, you kind of, you're wiping the gunk off of your face from like kind of a, a split night sleep, you know, like four hours and four hours. And as you're rubbing, you notice that your cheeks are bristlier. Puberty's hitting you hard, dude. Than they were before. You, you feel like you have this, it's like a five o'clock shadow, but it, it feels thicker. That's and a huge step because canonically he only had one facial hair. Yeah. Like episode <laughs> like 18 or something. Igmer has what feels like a, a beard coming in. And that's strange to him because, again, he, he had one facial hair not, not three weeks ago. All right. As long as it's super patchy, but most of a mustache. Oh, I'm sure he's got... I mean, it's not, it's, it's five o'clock shadow, but it's, you know, it could grow into a mustache <laughs> if Ickmer's going for right. the neck beard pedo stash combo. It's as long as it's ugly. <laughs> it doesn't have to be neck beard or pedo. It could be it the most be beautiful ugly. beard in the world. It's on Ickmer's face. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Ickmer wakes up and, and what is he doing? Well, uh, he would definitely get back to the front of the caravan in order to probably keep watch as best as possible. I'm He's like brisk walking as, alongside trying to, you know, be a guard. I would say he would also be close to the reins, uh, take the highest point possible as well sure. so that he could see as much as far uh, excuse me as far ahead as possible and try to be that the uh the best caravan guard and because he is up there sajira is also in that front uh cart as well yeah she's in the front wagon yep so is he taking a break from guarding to talk to her i wouldn't say he's taking a break just talking to her and trying to hopefully help her explain i guess what she said the other night okay so what's he say oh uh, excuse me sajira yes i i didn't want to you know disturb you or anything but i what you said the other day about me being a prince well i haven't exactly well been a prince yet or known how but to be honest a couple of people have told me well something along those lines and i i'm really wondering how how you you know about that i am very in tune with the future you could say my mind it it splits between where we are and where we're going and I can see something in you, Ikmar. Something different from your friends. I I can tell that you're not all half orc. Not like you think. Well, uh thank you. I uh I like to think of myself as a bit of a bit of a human myself. That's I, not what I meant, Ikmar. Oh, oh, okay. Listen, have you have you ever... Do you know about the Zarni? I... I... Do not. I... I have, uh... The, the only thing, I guess, is that they... I mean, a, a group of people, but I have not met them on the trail or I- anywhere else before. I am one of them, and we have... A very long tradition of, well, you you might call it a curse. We call it a gift, though. Many of the Zarni, uh, not, myself unincluded, unfortunately, have the gift of the wolf. They turn when the moon is fullest. They are what you may have heard of as werewolves. And I can see something in you, and then I'm not quite sure, but my vision last night, it, it seems to confirm it for me. 
If I saw the queen of the wolves passing last night when I held your hands by my crystal ball, I don't think that that is a coincidence that I can ignore. I called you prince because the wolves, they always have a ruler and it always comes from somewhere unexpected. I see something in you, Ikmar. And I don't know that I would see werewolf royalty in just anyone's divination. It's weird to me. That's why I saw it in you. It may not be true, but it makes me think. So what what exactly does that mean that I, I should do? I mean, I'm sure there's some sort of, well, training and... Uh, the king, I mean, it goes king, queen, uh, prince, right? And so the queen is dead. And and so does that mean the king is somewhere out there too? And I should, I don't know, I guess find him or something? There was a, a king and a queen of the wolves. I know not about either of them aside from what I saw last night. My visions are not always true, but they are always vivid. I can't tell you if the queen has actually died. I I don't know that. Or that may be something that, that happens far from now. I'm not sure. What I do know is that the hierarchy of werewolves is going to change, Ikma. I don't know exactly what your part is to play, but... I do think that you will play it. Whether or not you'd like to, whether or not you train, something is going to happen with you, I think. Oh, well, thank goodness, because I, I'm not sure I can I can do it right now, you know. I mean, we're, we're just a, a, a few travelers going, going to Lepidstadt. I, th- I mean... I, I'm pretty sure I'll have to figure out more, but I, well, th- this beer sounds pretty good right now. And, you know, what's wrong with double fisting at, <laughs> at 11 o'clock in the morning? But you, you, you can't drink all day if you don't start in the morning. Right, Sajira? <laughs> right, Dikma. That's why I'm having at least one. Oh, well, cheers to that. <laughs> I think I'll have to definitely figure out some more and this this is a lot of weight, you know. I I I I'm not quite sure well since since you're at Sarni, who who should I like go to, you know, to like you know, like I don't know, check in on my like prince status or I don't know if it's I mean we don't <laughs> even know if it's real. Hickmer <laughs> That's that's not exactly how it works, but I can introduce you to some people when we get to Lepidstadt. I can introduce you to my brothers and sisters. Not everyone in this caravan is a Zarni. In fact, I'm the only one. But we do travel in groups like this. There will be more in Lepidstadt, and I will be welcome with them. If you come with me, you will be welcome too, and and we can talk of such things. They will be able to see it in you if they possess, possess the gift. I'm unsure because I do not. Oh, okay. That that sounds good to me. I'll, I'll definitely come with you to figure it out. But, you know, if if you could, you know, not not really, like, spread the word too, too far around or... Like not say too much about I, this because I I'm I'm a bit worried that my friends might leave me for it. I wouldn't think of it, Ikmar. Don't don't even worry about it, and don't worry about the implications that are to come because they may not come. It is only a vision, nothing more. If it happens, it will happen either way, and if it does not, then. It was something in my mind that brought it forward that maybe wasn't even directed at you. Very well. 
you know, that's, uh, that's a good point. I should keep that in mind. And I'll get, I'll get back to, uh, watching the road. Okay. Matumbe, what's going on, buddy? So Matumbe is, you know, alternating between a couple things. One, his standard, you know, probably couple hours a day when he's not, um, guarding the caravan, walking next to it, reading his book. Um, reading while walking. The right. standard. Yeah, you could do that. Um, that's a not skill well. right there. That's like texting while walking. He, he walks into a fountain. I'll tell you what. He trips a lot. <laughs> you know, you see Matumbe go down. He looks around, makes sure nobody saw it. Keeps walking, opens the book back up. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, and talking to uh, Prince Zar, he wants to know more about the undead that used to rule this land. I mean, he's, you know, like we've said, a stranger in a strange land. Yeah. And he has a doubled down um, motivation to destroy the undead. I think it worries him that we're in a land that used to be controlled by the undead. Yeah. What would you ask of him as Matumbe? I think Matumbe would just ask what the circumstances around that were, how that came to be, and how it changed. M- Matumbe, have you ever heard of uh, a man named the Whispering Tyrant? The Whispering Tyrant? Sounds like someone who operates in the shadows. No, no he was I have not. very public, Matumbe, about oh, seven... Seven hundred years ago, if my if my books are, are to be believed, seven hundred years ago he was defeated by paladins, powerful men. But he did control all of Ustala beforehand. How powerful was this tyrant? He may as well have been a god. My, my God. He brought forth an army, an undead army, unlike anything that has ever been seen on Galarian or recorded. And you know this for sure to be true. This is what my books say. I cannot travel to find the answers for myself, but... If it is recorded, there may be some truth to it. One would not record something if it were not to be true. Well... It would not be worth recording. (laughs) Exactly what I think. And something this sinister, I, I do not think it's a fairy tale or... He he doesn't have a holy book. He he didn't become a god from it. Why why write about such things? Why why is there still a taint of undeath on Ustalov if not for the the presence of this man? I despise this taint. Well, it is a fact of life here, Matumbe. I. I apologize that you hate it so much. I mean, it seems many do here. You have so many followers of Phrasma. It's... You can tell that the the public is rebelling against this, but it still exists in the shadows of Usarov. Maybe there's something someone like I can do. Well, I think a man like you would do a lot here. I certainly hope so. Have you, by chance, if I may ask a personal question, experienced this taint yourself your entire life? Were you born here? I was not born here. I was brought here. Brought here? I was a slave, Matumbe. You know that this happens. In Ustalov, I was not. I was in Cheliax. I was a slave and I bought my freedom. It pains my heart to hear this. Being from the Mwangi Expanse, I have had dealings, thankfully brief, with the Aspis Consortium. They rape and pillage our world. They they take our people and do with them what they will, put them in chains. Not something I wish to discuss further. 
I experienced it when I came to Ustalav Matumbe. I am sorry to hear this. I end. was a whole man when I came to Ustalav. Now I, I have pleasures of the mind, but before I could, I could run and, and fight. If I may be so bold, may I ask how you came to be the way you are? This exact taint that I speak of. Why do you think I am so interested in the history of why this has plagued the land around here? I was beset by a group of ghouls and bitten and torn apart, as it were. I had one remaining arm when I was found, but the spread of the, the fever was quickly overcoming my body. It was the arm or my life. I would rather have none of that and be living than be among the dead. This is a point I cannot argue and a decision that I also would make myself better to cast off part of yourself than lose your whole. But I hope you are the type of man that, that takes a story like this and gets strength from it. I hope you attack this foulness in the land where I cannot. If anyone had a question with my resolve, hearing your story only strengthens it further. I will be the harbinger to destroy the undead here and take back Ustalav for the living and the glorification of the lady. And I think that's what you guys talk about. It's very much on this topic that Matumbe is clearly passionate about and... And that Prince Czar, you don't even know this man's real name, and he hasn't divulged it, but mm -hmm. he's been affected by this as well. I mean, that's why a person like him turns to books, not only to fill his time, but to just be able to give people like you information that hopefully will help you, or at least encourage you. Yeah, he, he can't fight it himself, but he can fight it by proxy. Exactly. He he knows that his greatest weapon right now is his mind. Ooh. Um, a man that Matumbe uh, can agree with. Yeah. And so you guys talk this way and the day passes relatively uneventfully. You set up camp for the evening. The next day... You set off again, much like before. I think you're just kind of getting to know the carnies. You have a couple of days left. You're getting to know them. By now, you have all met kind of this hunched man, calls himself Hap. He's He runs the flea circus for the carnies. Um, and you all also meet the, the giant man that you've seen, and, and he kind of... He especially takes a shine to Matumbe and Ikmer because they're kind of leading the caravan guarding. He does very much of that. His stride is so long being basically a giant. And his name is Trollblood. At least that's how he introduces himself to you guys. Um, and I think he, you know, he'll chat with Matumbe and Ikmer. He's not the most intelligent person. He's just kind of trying to pass the time. You guys, in the second day, pass the town of Trimverina uh, and continue. You know that this is the first of two towns that you will pass before you get to Lepidstat. I think it happens about midday. So if you had wanted to stop for anything, you may. But you know there's another town coming up. So it's up to you. Let's roll, baby. So you keep going. So you guys roll forward into another day of travel. More people on the road at this point because it's it's closer to a town. You're noticing that, that people are giving kind of, not disgusted, but maybe curious looks at, at the, the group of carnies you're traveling with. And by extension, you, for traveling with them. You continue on tonight. This would be your fourth night of travel, I believe. 
throughout the day, I'd like to say that Ikmer has been quite proud of his abilities so far as caravan guard and leading the leading the troop as even though people might look uh down upon the the group as a whole as they're passing by i think ikmer would really hold his head high troll blood would i mean he's he's trying to take point with you as much as he can being a really imposing figure and i think he would look to ikmer Hey boy, you've uh, you've done this before, haven't you? Yeah, that's that's uh, very true. There's been a, a well, I used to to earn a little bit of coin here and there. Uh, well, doing doing this exact thing. It's really it's wonderful having you here because it, normally uh, I'm the only one that that does this. It, it gets tiring. I, I'm sitting here, you know, I I stay in front of the caravan all day. I walk, and I walk, and I walk. And it... I never get a ride in any of the caravan. The, the horses, they, they could not hold me. And he stands. I mean, you are maybe mid-chest on this guy. You didn't cast him as any specific person, Who have you? Who be? <laughs> I mean, he, he will be back, but you know, he's just going to go take a pee, and then he will be back. Can you say, get to the caravan? Get to the caravan! <laughs> yes! <laughs> Hurry! I mean, s- still, no specific casting, just a no, never. soft I, These are all voices that I just, you know, they, they come out of me like a creative process. Says troll blood. <laughs> <laughs> I've been working on my acting. I also think I might have a good role in government. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, tro- troll blood. I mean, is that really your your real name? I mean, it, it seems a bit odd to call you that. No, no, my boy. Yeah, that that is my stage name. I, the my friends call me Seymour. That's my real name. <laughs> what is so funny? Man? Why, why are you laughing at my Seymour is a perfectly common name. But, yeah, do, you, do you have a do you have a last name? Seymour Wiener. <laughs> God. Seymour Wiener. <laughs> Greatest. Greatest character so far, <laughs> if you ask me. So, uh, Seymour, C- what what exactly I'm trying to do is uh, look far ahead and make sure that if if there's anybody blocking the road, that that could mean a cu- a couple of a couple of things. See, sometimes there are people that are just broken down by the road and like we were. Well, yeah, exactly. But then there's other people that are just stopped along the road, and then they ambush a, a, a well, a, a stopping party. And so you don't want to do that. And so if you look around the stopped uh, cart or what have you, that that's a good indicator of in, indicator if they are going to, you know, ha- harass you. I feel a lot more comfortable with with you and the other little man, uh, the the man with the book. Uh, you make me so much more comfortable. I it was just me protecting this group, and now I have all of these friends. You guys look so top. I'm glad you're taking point. I'm watching the perimeter. Oh well, that's a that's a very good idea because there's. A- well, there are sometimes attacks that come from the the sides, and that well, if there's a very very fast say predator in the woods, every once in a while that that happens. So be careful for that too. Well, if I'm doing a a patrol and and you you see anything, you just yell, Weena. We know. Don't get angry. So you and Seymour have this conversation. 
I'm sure this ends with a handshake. And you both and, flex. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Hands laying on the forearms. Yeah. And it's super flexy, oiled up. Yeah. For a second, Ickmer looks like Carl Weathers. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> So you guys have this conversation, and you make it to dusk unmolested. You go to bed, wake up the next morning, keep trekking. Again, it's it's getting sparse now that you're a little bit further from town. Luckily, nothing seems to be amiss, aside from the fact that you can now see mountains in the background, large mountains, and you're starting to see it become more wooded around the trail. It's getting, you know, there's, there's large pine trees on either side of the trail. As you continue forward, you rest that night in essentially what is a path cut in the outskirts of a forest. This night, as Ikmer keeps watch, again, he hears it, the howling. But this time, he almost feels like he can understand it. It doesn't sound like animals. Not this deep in the woods. He almost interprets it as a calling. Like someone yelling, come here. And I think Ikmer resists the urge to do so. He keeps his vigil through the night. Manages to stay put, but there's something telling him that that deep in this forest, someone's waiting. Maybe several someones. People he's never met, but tonight he feels some kind of kinship with them as they're awake all night with him. Ickmar still hasn't forgotten about the the night that he can't exactly remember and is woken up with bloody torn clothes and so he he definitely keeps that in mind as as all of these things are happening at night he would have these thoughts like he doesn't know himself quite as much anymore maybe morning comes and the party sets off again they're getting closer to Lepidstead and they're actually getting closer to the second town on their journey, a town called Corto. Eclipse starts to remember maybe the path they're on because she remembers Corto, or at least living around it. Yeah, uh, she would be hit almost with like a, a wave of like nostalgia a little bit here. And she lived kind of between Corto and, and the Shutterwood Forest. And during this time, I think she would kind of take it a little bit slower. Uh, she she'd tell everyone like don't worry, I'm going to I'm going to fall back, but I'll catch I'll catch up and my mind stayed without an issue. So don't worry about me. And she'll just fall back a little and like take a little bit more time watching the path. And as she's away from anyone, she would say, "Hey, uh, Vance, how familiar are you with werewolves and shifters?" <laughs> <laughs> I fought one once. Filthy Zarni is after my gold. <laughs> he took one look at me and my axe, and he realized that I might have been a bigger threat than he realized. Then he changed, though, or shifted, whatever you want to call it. One of the most exhilarating fights I've ever been a part of. I just wish I could have finished him off. That would have been a kill to be proud of, wouldn't it? Well, uh, you're in my brain, though, right? So, yeah. uh, you can see how familiar I am, right? I lived between the Shutterwood and Corteau for years. Corteau plagued with the devil in gray. And in, like, E's head, she would flash, like, images of what she can remember, which is, like, when she went to town with her parents, there were always, like, rumored shifters with, like, really bright green or like very bright yellow eyes and like a little more hairy a little more gruff looking like all around town they were just rumored shifters and then a drawing of the devil in gray would be all over the place to like 
warn people. So she'd kind of flash those images in her head so that Vance could kind of take a look of what she's also thinking of. And then she'd say, So, Vance, what do you think of our closest friend there, huh? Eyes a little more yellow? Do you notice any changes? Hmm. Maybe you'll shift some of the attention off of us. <laughs> Let's see how your friends deal with a real monster in their midst. We better watch him and keep that blade close. You think he even knows? He's so young to turn. Well, when he's a little lost and confused, we need to be there for him. We can, we can be his best friend. He's on our side now. And with that, Eclipse summons her mind steed and heads back to the rest of the group. Hell yeah, she does. The group reaches Corto by the end of the day. Sets up camp. You know, it is a day's journey to Lepidstat from here. You doing anything in Corto? Or are we keeping going. We really don't have anything to sell, so there really, or I guess any money to buy with, so I don't think there's any reason to really stop. Yeah, and the entire time that we're riding through or anywhere near Corto, Eclipse is either in a wagon, like inside the caravan wagons, or like hood up and trying to avoid speaking or kind of being noticed at all. Okay. Since eyes are already on the caravan, she does not want to be... Yeah, I mean, this caravan is kind of the center of attention, so it makes sense that Eclipse might want to stay hidden, considering she's somewhat of an oddity herself. Yeah, people in Corto would generally probably recognize Eclipse. It's not not common that uh, Wyang would be in this area as a whole. Yeah. They would recognize her. So you guys set up camp, rest for the night, take off in the morning... Does anyone else know where Eclipse is from? I don't think so. Okay. As a player, I don't. (laughs) As a character, also in the dark. Also, I don't. As a GM, I do. No way. (laughs) Wow, weird. But yeah, it it just it hasn't come up yet. Um, so yeah. And if if anyone has asked, she probably just responded near a forest, like. (laughs) That would be it. Nobody asks, though, because nobody gives a fuck <laughs> about <laughs> anybody's characters, apparently. It's fine. Hey. Hey, Larry, you I'm... have this deep, dark backstory in some sort of nautical cave. Where was that? Nobody asks. Nobody knows that? <laughs> okay. I have I have, I have, have some inclination. I have nothing to apologize for. I've been very clear where I'm from. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. I, there is definitely one character... That is very clear. I know where they came from. <laughs> <laughs> the, what the, the fan art doesn't say Mwangi life on the knuckles <laughs> of his armor. <laughs> There's gonna be like an episode 200 reveal. That's like Matumbe's not from the Mwangi. Matumbe is from Irisin, and it's gonna shake the canon of this world <laughs> to its core. There is going to be so much wiki articles to change. <laughs> So, a day passes, a day of travel. As the dust starts to settle, and the sun starts to fall in the sky, and you see this orange hue fall over everything, over the crest of a hill, you see this city. Not magnificent, like some of you might have expected. Small for a city. But it's there. You see the rivers crossing through it. And you see that your path leads to this kind of grand bridge. Crossing over the river and into the city of Lepidstadt. (laughs) You make your way to the bridge. The dusty trail turns to cobblestone. You cross over and enter on a town in a frenzy. You enter Lepidstadt on this throng of people. 
shouting, some partying, some arguing, but the town is bustling at sundown. You see what appears to be this large wicker man in the courtyard of town, 30 feet tall, made of sticks and twigs and brush, but it resembles a man and it has a cage in its chest. And you hear a town crier from afar yell, Burgers of Leopardstadt rejoice! The beast has been captured! Soon the abomination will be tried for crimes against the good people of Veland. The punishing man now rises in the square outside the courthouse. The logs have been stacked against his flanks and the oil has seeped into his veins. The punishing man waits to take his passenger to the depths of hell. And soon he shall have his feast. You hear this, and your caravan is at all sides beset by crowds of people. Violin and Lepidstadt itself are a darker place than you expected, a place where they burn people to death. And before you resolve anything, I need you to finish your drinks, because we'll see you next week. Oh, oh man. It. I knew it. <laughs>